Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our virtual public meeting. I realize that we have uh, hit capacity at 500. I do want to let you know that we will be recording this, adding some closed captioning and posting it tomorrow morning. So before we get started there, I will also let you know that we will be taking questions through the chat function. So if you have questions for any of the speakers while we're having the presentation, please feel free to use the chat pod to put those questions in there. We will have a question and answer section at the end of the presentation. We will go through some of those questions. Any and all questions that you guys have, we will get back to you. We will provide it if they're not even if they're not recorded this evening, we'll have them available for you in the morning. This meeting is a community meeting to give you information about the Bobcat fire and to provide you a forum for questions and answers. We would love to have a community meeting where we could all see your faces, uh, but in the time of pandemic, we're trying to use the tools and technologies that we have at our disposal and Zoom is a really good one. So my name is Kristen Allison. I'm the information officer for California Incident Management Team One and I'll be facilitating. I'm gonna go through who we have as speakers this evening. So we're going to have a welcome from our agency administrator, Jerry Perez. We're gonna have Congresswoman representing the 27th district, Judy Chu. We're gonna have a, a statement from Hilda Solis. She is the county supervisor for the first district. We are going to have LA County Unified Commander Chief Deputy David Richardson. We will have our operations section chief for California Incident Management Team 2, Chad Cook. We will have the incident commander of California Incident Management Team 1, Jerry McGowan. We will have the Sheriff's Captain David Flores from the Sheriff's Office. We will have the American Red Cross with Miriam Mahundi. So to get started, Forest Supervisor Jerry Perez. Okay, just doing a sound check, Kristen, making sure folks can hear me. I, I have you loud and clear, Jerry. Okay, so thank you, Kristen. Again, my name is Jerry Perez. I'm a forest supervisor for the Angeles National Forest. I want to welcome you to tonight's meeting. As Kristen mentioned, um, with COVID, uh, it results in us um, having meetings uh, virtually and myself not being in the main room with some of the other speakers. So um, also wanted to welcome Congresswoman Chu and um, Ryan Urias uh, from uh, uh, Supervisor Solis's office. So I just wanted to touch on three things and I'll turn it back to Kristen. It's kind of where we're at California wise, why? Um, it'll give you an idea of some of the other things that are gonna come up in this conversation. A little bit about the past few months here on the Angeles Require and then the closure order that's in effect. So to start with, um, just so that you're aware, um, Almost every national forest in California has a fire, a major fire, and um, 3 million acres have burned to date. That's the most ever in history in the state of California, at least in the most modern time. And usually we get one to one, maybe a million acres or less a year. So uh, it's really unprecedented is what we call it. It's never been seen like this before. So. Um, the reason I talk about that is, is because all of the forests need resources. And so it's stretching our resources apart along the way. And also um, last week, we saw the explosion of fire in Oregon and Washington. And so you'll hear about some of the resources we have, but, um, oops, I, thank you. Um, so um, you'll hear about some of the resources we have, but the challenge we have also is sharing them among all the different forests with fire. So uh, just to give you that idea of where things are at. From an ANF perspective, um, we have started having fires, um, started getting about 20 to 25 starts a week on the Angeles National Forest in um, about late June, early July. Uh, the reason you don't hear about those is they tend to be small. We have great relationships with many of the partners that you see in the room there, LA County, fire, 
also with um, local fire departments. And so we've been able to catch most of those. In fact, most of the times I don't even hear about them because it's usually, I don't get noticed until they're 10 acres or more. So we've been working very hard at that, um, that number, trying not to have fires um, have getting larger than 10 acres. Unfortunately, this year we've had four major incidents so far on the Angeles National Forest. The dam fire started at the end of July and burned about 230 acres just um, inside the mouth of the San Gabriel Canyon. Shortly after that, um, on August 12th, we had the lake fire up by uh, Lancaster, a little west. That was almost 31, it was a little over 31,000 acres. Then um, came along the, um, the Ranch 2 fire just above Azusa, and that was 4,500 acres. And then on Labor Day weekend, on Sunday the 6th, was the start of the Bobcat fire. So you have to remember, Labor Day weekend, a lot of people in the canyon. It started about seven miles off uh, Highway 39 by Dodgewell um, Dam. So, and it was also about 115 degrees out that day, if folks remember. It's probably one of the most hottest days in most recent times here in LA. So we were able to get crews in there, three engines, but it's a one-way road in and out. And by the next afternoon, 24 hours later, the fire was 5,000 acres in size. And it's continued to grow to where today it's over 33,000 acres. We brought in a type one team to help um, fight the fire and help to kind of do all the logistics. And you'll hear from the incident commander, Jerry McGowan. Uh, we recognize the, the complexity of this fire, where it started. It's already over to um, north to Highway 2, east to Highway 39, and um, sl has slumped over a little bit over towards Crystal Lake Recreation Area. And then also, um, as you know, it is um, bumping along the foothill communities as well as heading towards Mount Wilson. So a lot of um, uh, fires occurred and um, we are trying each day to find ways to slow this down, but it's a, it's a beast unto itself. So just wanted to give you some of those kind of numbers of where we're at. So again, I wanted to give you kind of the broad perspective of how the resources are stretched, what we're trying to do here on the um, Bobcat fire. And then lastly, I just want to talk about the angels itself. A week ago, my boss, Randy Moore, the regional forester in Vallejo, issued a closure order closing all 18 national forests in California. When I state close, that means no recreational use on the national forest. You can drive your car on Highway 2, where it's open. A lot of it's closed now due to the fire. You can drive on county roads, but you cannot get out and recreate. The order was initially going to expire today. We had a call with the regional forester and his team uh, this morning. And given where we're at with all the fires that are going on, uh, we elected to close the forest for an additional week. Again, it's because our resources are stretched. And so we don't have resources to deal with those other fires, what we call initial attack. We continue to get those. I think we had three on Sunday or Saturday, if I remember right. So we have to pull people away from one incident to another. So. It's a stretch on resources. So that's the main reason we have elected to keep the national forest closed for another week. And I ask your cooperation in this. Um, and I also want you to be aware um, in July, I did sign a notice that we are at extreme conditions, which means no fire on the Angels National Forest. And when I mean no fire, it means no camp, campfires, which everyone gets, no bonfires, which everyone gets, but no barbecues. No propane stoves can be used. Please keep your big lighter in your pocket. Things are so dry out there now that um, we cannot afford another fire um, on the landscape. And so then lastly, I just want to say, you know, we recognize this is difficult for you and as an agency, it's difficult for us. As professionals on the Angeles National Forest, these are resources that we too care about and we would hate to see them destroyed by fire. And personally, on a, our own living in the communities there with you, our folks, many of my employees live within the Foothill communities and they too are affected. And we're part of your community and we feel your pain. Um, we know many of my employees as well as you are in these evacuation orders and have been evacuated. So um, we're part of the community, we feel your pain 
and we want to be able to convey to you as much information as we can tonight. So thank you and thank you for joining us and I'll turn it back to you, Kristen. Thank you so much, Jerry. The Congresswoman uh, on the 27th District, Judy Chu. Good everybody. Thank you for joining us during this very critical event. We are facing uh, a, an extraordinary moment now at a time of historic unemployment and a spreading pandemic. California has also seen a record-breaking fire season that's resulted in the greatest number of acres burned and some of the largest wildfires our country has ever seen. Our whole state has been ravaged by these fires and now it is in the San Gabriel Mountains. With life and property at risk from these historic fires, I know many of you have questions and I want you to know that your leaders at every level of government are working together closely to help protect you. Our number one priority is making sure everyone is informed of the fire's progress so that they have as much time as possible to find safety. And that's why as soon as the Bobcat fire started, I began having daily communication with U.S. Forest Supervisor Jerry Perez, who you just heard from, regarding its development. And I've relayed that information to my constituents on a regular basis. I want to thank Supervisor Perez for his incredible leadership and responsiveness during this crisis as well as the whole management team and the brave forest service and firefighting crews that are battling this blaze. Because of the difficulty of the deep terrain in this forest, the fire has spread to over 36,000 acres and is still only 6% contained. The Bobcat fire is now one of the largest fires ever in California. And after days of the fire moving to the north, um, we must watch for our foothill communities in as heavy smoke has made it difficult for airplanes to drop fire retardant in this area. But despite these challenges, our firefighters and frontline staff have been doing an incredible job of protecting us. Make no mistake, dry vegetation and high temperatures have made these fires across California difficult to control but that has not slowed down our men and women who are tackling these blazes night, day and night. Here in the San Gabriel Valley, we've had heroes from across the region who will continue to do everything they can to protect our foothill communities. And so grateful for the fire management team that has ensured that our capacity of firefighters has more than quadrupled. And in fact, now it's 890 firefighters that have been allocated to this area since the start of this fire. I cannot thank these heroes enough. I want you to know also that I'm doing everything I can to prioritize emergency relief in Congress. Recently, I spoke with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi um, about the means for federal emergency assistance and she pointed out that there are two bills that passed out of the house that provides 3.5 billion for disaster relief across the nation we are waiting at action by the senate today i talked to house appropriators there actually is an existing 41 billion dollars available for federal disaster assistance but clearly regardless of where it comes from congress must step up to provide relief and assistance with these challenges along with the COVID-19 pandemic issues. While I encourage everyone to pay close attention to any evacuation orders and evacuation warnings, we have a great deal of work ahead of us. I urge you all to stay informed. My office is here to help. So please feel free to call us at 626-304-0110 if you have any questions or need the latest information. I want to once again, thank our firefighters and frontline team who are keeping us safe as well as the many men and women in the cities of Monrovia, Arcadia, Sierra Madre, Pasadena, and Altadena who are keeping us informed during these challenging times. And finally, for those of you that want to help, please contact the local Red Cross at 626-447-2193 to see how you can be of assistance. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman. With that, we're gonna go ahead and get started in the room. Uh, before we get started, I was going to um, 
do a little bit around the horn so we can do some introductions um, and then we'll take some of the speakers. So we'll start here on the left hand side. Captain Andy Bird, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. I represent the Sandy State. Captain David Flores. Thank you. So our first presentation will be Unified uh, Agency Administrator, LA County Chief Deputy David Richardson. Yes, good evening once again. Uh, David Richardson, Chief Deputy of Emergency Operations for Los Angeles County Fire Department on behalf of our Fire Chief, Darrell Osmonds. Thank you for joining us this evening. Hopefully we'll be able to provide you um, an overview and be able to uh, give an insight to what's occurring on the Bobcat incident that's impacting your communities. As you know, we're in the middle of really a fire street, fire siege of an extremely challenging and active wildfire season. As mentioned by uh, Supervisor, uh, President of the uh, National Forest, it's not just here in Southern California where the Angeles National Forest has been impacted, but also throughout the entire state and really the western half of the U.S. I can tell you since last Sunday, it's truly been a unified effort, not only at the National Forest, Los Angeles County Fire Department, but working, of course, with your fire departments, our partners, City of Monrovia, Arcadia, Sierra Madre, Pasadena, Fire Department is working to put a good plan together to battle this emerging wildland fire, which is also impacting the communities of the city of Gordy, Bradbury, and Azusa. I can truly tell you that the cooperation and uh, insight with all the cooperators working as one unified effort uh, is second to none here in the LA region. Um, uh, I hope you will be proud of that, uh, the, the current circumstances and, and conditions that you face with uh, your communities and, and your family members, but to know that not only your firefighters, but your local law enforcement uh, working together to put together a solid plan to ensure your safety. Our thoughts and prayers go out to all of you who are impacted by these destructive wildland fires and continue to pose a threat in your communities. It really is. Firefighters will continue to work on gaining an upper hand on the Bobcat fire while focusing on structured defense. Where you can see the last couple days uh, within your communities, firefighters doing their best possible to minimize any damage to structures. And bottom line is we ask that you all as community members remain vigilant during this point in time. Because I know as we all deal with COVID-19 and the other challenges that come along uh, on top of dealing with the wildland fire is sometimes overwhelming. Really, as most of you, especially our evacuees that are impacted, know you need to have an emergency plan in place. And one thing here in Southern California that we profess as uh, first responders as your public safety is that of having an emergency plan and ready, set, go. Um, any one of your fire departments, any one of your fire agencies here in Southern California can readily access a ready, set, go and wildfire action plan if you have not had the opportunity to do so as of yet. 
to be prepared in the event you are asked to evacuate. And if you are, we ask uh, you evacuate without hesitation. The reality, as mentioned already, this wildland fire season is uh, has really been off the charts. Especially with the predicted fire weather that's uh, coming in the fall months where we typically have the Santa Ana winds. We're expecting above average temperatures going into the winter season, or basically October through December. In addition to that, we're expected to have a high number of Santa Ana winds. And uh, those, as we know here in Southern California, are devastating. And it could cause horrific damage when we do have a wildland fire. Lastly, I wanted to share uh, Chief Osby, my boss, working with uh, your local departments, your local agencies, and working with uh, the uh, state of California and federal partners. Yesterday, a federal management assistance grant was approved uh, by FEMA, where in fact it does provide some uh, fiscal relief, financial relief, or firefighting costs and efforts associated with the Bobcat Fire. So, with that, uh, we'll leave you. Uh, be safe out there. Uh, know that your firefighters are doing their best uh, possible. Uh, additional firefighters are coming in daily, again, to help get a containment line around this fire and uh, once and for all put it out here in the days to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief. Next, we're going to have a written statement from LA County Supervisor, First District, Hilda Solis. Dan. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Urias. Um, I'm a senior field deputy for Los Angeles County Supervisor Hilda Solis. Um, the supervisor wasn't able to join us tonight, but she wanted me to read the following statement. Uh, big thank you uh, with to Supervisor uh, Jerry Perez and the Los Angeles National Forest Team. Um, also to CAL FIRE, United Command U.S. Forest Service, the Los Angeles County Fire Department, Monrovia Fire Department, Arcadia, Red Cross, and every other brave first responders on the front lines uh, battling the Bobcat Fire and other fires in our region. Almost 900 firefighters have been assigned to combat the blaze. They are unsung heroes. Unfortunately, we have uh, over 36,000 acres with only 6% containment. Um, that started on September 6. There is still a significant uh, western growth towards Mount Wilson and the Chantry Flat area in Santa Anita Canyon, marking a shift from last week's northeastern expansion. The fire poses continued threats to our structures and our Foothill City residents. Threats remain to Cogswell Dam and Crystal Lake, high tension power lines in Mount Wilson Observatory, Chantry and Foothills communities, Power to the Foothill communities, which serves 131,889 people. Threat to 500K uh, D power lines, which power a large portion of Los Angeles. Uh, threat to multiple archeological sites, spotted owl habitat, habitat for protected fish species, and commercial restoration sites. More than 350 households in Arcadia, the Sierra Madre, and Sierra Madre remain under evacuation orders Monday, as flames from Bobcat fire creep towards San Gabriel Valley Foothill communities. The worsened air quality severely impacts our residents along Foothill cities, including Azusa in my district. I want to remind all community members who live in and near wildland areas to be prepared. Our county fire department's Ready, Set, Go program is a vital tool for families. It will help you be prepared in the event you are asked to evacuate your home. The Ready, Set, Go program can be found at fire.allycounty.gov. While dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change and mandatory fire evacuations, power outages and bad air quality, we're staying focused on keeping affected families safe. There are so many vi uh, variables outside of our control. For one, California has been experiencing a drought these past seven years. This drought, coupled with our recent extreme temperatures, is a recipe for large-scale fires. 
It is alarming the number of, of wild land fires increasing each year. And each year, these fires are becoming more intense and widespread. So far this year, California has experienced three of our four largest fires in our state's history, and we're just entering our regular fire season. We must acknowledge that climate change is at the heart of this devastation, but is why we are experiencing these droughts and continuing, continuing rise of sea levels. Rolling blackouts due to heat waves are another challenge. Blackouts, unhealthy air quality, high temperatures, and the pandemic impose real hardships on our local residents, especially for our disadvantaged communities. The unhealthy air quality is especially concerning for our young children, seniors and residents uh, with existing respiratory illness. It is why I have introduced a board motion along with Supervisor Barger as a co-author. The motion directs relevant county departments to take a comprehensive look at our energy resilience and emergency backup uh, systems. Supervisor Barger will also be introducing an emergency proclamation tomorrow to declare Bobcat as a, an emergency in Los Angeles County. We must ensure our clean green energy portfolio is diversified and adequately supported so we can so we could rely on it in times of natural disasters. I want to say once again that we all owe a debt of gratitude to our firefighters as they continue to protect our communities while battling wildfires. Thank you, Los Angeles County Supervisor Hilda Solis. I appreciate that, Brian. Thank you so much. Next, we're going to have Operations Section Chief Chad Cook give an operational update on the fire. Good evening, everyone. I'm Chad Cook from California Incident Management Team 1, and I'm representing Jerry McGowan and our entire team on our operational statement for tonight on where we're at with our fire. Before I get into that, though, I just want to cover a couple of quick things. The, the operational briefing for this, especially for a community meeting, doesn't often tell the story of how we got here today. It more or less sets the current situation on the fire, and it tells us what we're doing to stabilize the incident in and around your communities. So as I speak to the camera, and I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna to speak to the map a little bit as the quintessential tool for us to be able to paint a picture to you of the information that you wanna know that was actively happening out there on fire. So with that, I'm gonna to go to the map real quick and discuss some of the current actions and some of the progress on the fire. As we go down here, this is the current footprint of the fire. And you know that just over one week ago after the fire started, we saw significant growth both to the north and to the east, not to mention to the south and to the west. With uh, fuel and fire behavior conditions that will be spoken about regarding our weather phenomenon that takes place. You've heard people talk about our Santa Ana wind. We went through one light Santa Ana wind where the fire was influenced greatly by low relative humidities. This current footprint of the fire continues to grow. Most of the growth that you're seeing on the incident is out to the west currently right now. And I'm going to start with lower Quinto communities. As you look at this map of the lower Quinto communities, you're going to see a color-coded graph on the bottom that designates different structure protection zones. They also protect, it also shows cities that are in here that have been that have been identified as threats. The County of Los Angeles and all the partners agencies between Monrovia, Arcadia, Duarte, Azusa, Glendora, Sierra Madre out to Pasadena all have a representation here by what triggers have been set in the event communities are impacted by fire. The fire currently sits right above Monrovia and very close to the Arcadia area where the fire is into the Santa Anita Canyon area. Today, crews had success along the bottom with a burn operation last night to keep it from progressing to the south into the homes. That cooled off nicely, and a lot of the work that went in by firefighters today kept that holding the current footprint without any southern movement of the fire. That is what we consider one of the stabilization factors from fire moving into the communities. And that was a success last night with that operation, and it is holding the current footprint today. As we move up the shoulder of it, we'll call it the left side of the fire moving west. Fire continues to progress towards Mount Wilson. Mount Wilson is still under a, a threat. We have numerous resources that are sitting at Mount Wilson to defend the communication infrastructure. We have firefighters with several lines that are in place that have been backed up with retardant that have fire pushing those lines. This is steep, inaccessible terrain, fairly inaccessible terrain that's very difficult to get into. We're taking our time, we're trying to get in there so we can use one of these lines and we can stop the western progression of fire. As you move up into this uh, division delta area of the fire, this division delta area ran into the station burn scar. 
The station burn scar was a prior fire from many years ago where the fuel has had a drastic change in continuity and in consistency of fuels, which has slowed the fire progress down. As you move to the north, to the north up into the uh, Highway 2 corridor, all the way up on top where you get to the higher, higher elevation, you have a definite fuel model change, which changes not only from a brush and chaparral to more of a timber component and a little sparser fuels. We've had success holding that. We've had several spot fires over the tube, but we've been able to pick all of those up. And firefighters up on the top have had success this afternoon in keeping it from any northern spread. I'm going to turn around and look to the east side of your fire. As I move down the east side of the fire into the Division Juliet area, we'll call that the Highway 39, Azusa Canyon, San Gabriel Canyon Road. This entire corridor is, encompasses the east side has had very little movement. It has been held up and checked up on several of the ridge systems that overlook the 39 corridor. Firefighters have been in and around all of the structures, including the Crystal Lake area and a strong presence is in there to stop any eastern progression of fire. We've had a lot of success here for some of the movement of fires today. And again, it's holding its current footprint. You'll see a lot less smoke production coming off the east side of the fire uh, due to fuels burning out and some of that happening on that side. As we move down into Division November, which is right up uh, basically above the Duarte area, you'll see a lot of activity tonight. Uh, one of the main primary containment lines that you saw this afternoon we had a burn operation to stop any southern progress of fire down into the communities and the homes. That has gone very well this afternoon for us to stop any of that fire spread. And we're tying it back into just above Monrovia and near the Boy Scout camp, uh, Brash camp that's up there in uh, the Monrovia Canyon area. And that has all gone very, very successful today. So with that, that's a current overview of the fire operations. You should see a lot less smoke production in and around the residential structures that are in Monrovia, Arcadia, as we start to bring close to some of the stuff going on in the political communities. You will still see active fire spread though out to the west until our containment lines are solidified. That's our current picture of the fire. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chad. Our next speaker, we're going to have our incident uh, commander for California Incident Management Team 1, Jerry McGowan. Good evening. Um, I'll give you a couple of things about the footprint that Chad was talking about. The total, the total size of this fire is 36,366 acres. And right now, currently, it's 6% contained. But as you were, as Chad was talking about, there'll, there'll be more coming, as we were expecting. The total miles around the footprint that Chad was talking about there is about 45, 45 miles and some very difficult uh, ground. So, so far that what we've constructed is 20 miles of dozer line and three miles of hand line. Um, and looking at the values at risk at a minimum, it, as we talked about, is Mount Wilson and uh, the observatory up there and the communication systems and all those things that are surrounding that. The south is everything, everybody has been mentioned is Monrovia, uh, Arcadia, Sierra Madre, Bradbury, Azusa, Pasadena, Altadena, and Duarte. So we, have, we currently have 888 personnel assigned to the fire now, mostly of uh, federal and local agency. There we have nine dozers, 95 engines, and 16 hand crew. With the, with, as we talked about earlier with the, with the fires that are all within the Western US, we are prioritizing the resources and the placement of those resources and working at aircraft with, when the smoke allows. Um, Resources are uh, diligently working and tactically uh, suppressing the fire uh, while keeping with the emphasis of the priorities I spoke of earlier. I believe that all the firefighters are giving their best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. Our next speaker will be uh, on evacuations, Captain David Flores. Good evening, I'm Captain Dave Flores of Temple Sheriff Station. I'd like to talk about area closures and evacuations. So far, following is what has been evacuated. The East Fork, the Angeles National Forest, Highway 39, all campgrounds, including the Crystal Lake area, the Angeles Crest Highway above mile marker 44, and the city of Arcadia, north of Elkins Avenue between Santa Anita on the west and Oak Place on the east. In the city of Sierra Madre, north of Elkins Avenue and east of Santa Anita. The Chantry Flats area, Mount Wilson and the Angeles National Forest is closed until further notice. 
Temple Station also uh, has in its jurisdiction a five contract cities, the cities of Bradbury and Borden. Uh, rest assured, I've been in communication with city officials there. Uh, in Borden, in those areas, you've received uh, evacuation warnings, uh, but as of now, it seems as though the fire is moving away from your area. Uh, rest assured, the Sheriff's Department, uh, we have shored up our patrol cadre. Uh, we are on uh, 12 and 12 shifts, and so we are prepared to uh, protect these areas if evacuations occur from looters and protecting their homes. Right. Thank you so much, Captain. Our next speaker is going to be from the American Red Cross, Miriam Mahundi. Uh, my name is Mario Mohamin, and I'm the Chief Communications Officer for the American Red Cross. Um, I want to thank everybody for inviting us today to speak. Um, on Sunday, September 13th, we opened up an evacuation point at Santa Anita Park. And everybody is, anybody is welcome who's evacuating to come there. It's still open, and we do have volunteer staffing in 24 hours. Um, to date, we have helped about 35 individuals with um, sheltering, which means that we have put them into hotels. It also provided three meals a day, as well as other resources and services like health, health and mental health um, services. I want to take this moment to thank all the Red Cross volunteers. 90% of our work is done by volunteers. And um, from San Diego to all the way to Washington State, hundreds of people have come out to help. And we really um, thank them for all of this, their dedication. If you want some more information about what you can do to prepare, please go to redcross.org slash help. Thank you so much. From here, we're going to go into a question and answer. If you do have uh, continued questions, please use the chat box. We'll be pulling the questions from there. And as a reminder, this will be recorded. We will get to all of your questions. Um, we will end this call at 8 o'clock, but you can continue to put those questions in there. And any questions that we don't answer live here tonight, we'll make sure that we get those. And we'll, give you, uh, we'll provide the answers to those uh, when we post this. So our first question is about some of the fire weather and we have Rich Thompson, an incident meteorologist to talk about the general fire weather and the wind direction. Uh, good evening, I'm Rich Thompson, incident meteorologist with the National Weather Service. Uh, fire weather wise, uh, we're experiencing for the next few days just very cool conditions for this time of year in Southern California. Uh, during the daytime hours, we're gonna have uh, warm temperatures and dry conditions. You're looking for temperatures probably during the day, mid 80s, mid 90s for the most part. Humidity is dropping down during the day, probably into the teens and single digits, and we're going to 8 to 20 percent. At nighttime, you expect cooler temperatures, some humidity recovery. Uh, at humidity recovery at night will be generally 30 to 50 percent or so. Okay, and so that's going to keep conditions warm and dry across the fire, both through the day and nighttime hours. So that'll keep the respective temperature and humidity. Keep the fire weather keep the fire relatively active both day and night. As for winds, we're expecting just typical winds during the daytime hours. You have a southerly wind or an upcanning wind, gusting probably around 10 15 miles per hour. Then once the sun goes down, the evening and overnight hours, you have kind of a generally light northeasterly or down canning wind, about five to ten miles per hour in the windier spot. So overall, just very typical conditions we're expecting across the fire for the next several days. Thank you so much, Rich. Our next question uh, is coming to us is why was the forest left open given the number of fires? Uh, Jerry? Thanks, Kristen. So um, closing the forest is a, a complicated affair and I know people are gonna chat about that also. I've been watching the chat room quite extensively. We, for every person that asks for the forest to be closed, there's probably two or three who ask for the forest to be open. So it was discussions to figure out what would be the best way to help um, keep the forest accessible to the public so people could recreate and enjoy the forest, as well as try to manage for fire. So we elected to keep the forest open. And then as the weekend progressed, we began to have discussions with our Office of General Counsel on closing them. Uh, it takes time. It's not an easy thing to do. And a lot of times we struggle with even people um, observing the order. So this time we are having people observe it. And that's why we're revisiting when we want to open up again. So um, it's, a, it's a long discussion. 
And it's something that, you know, you may think I can just turn the switch overnight and close the forest, but is more complicated than that. Um, people don't abide by the closure order. We need a closure order, in fact, to enforce it. We don't have anything out there. People don't can say that we don't have the legal authority to kick them off the forest. So um, there was discussions and it's also about making sure that people can still enjoy their public land. So it's a balancing act. And so um, after the fire started, we decided it was time to shut down the forest at this juncture. Back to you, Kristen. Thank you, Jerry. Our next question is how did the fire start? We're gonna have Chief uh, Bobby Garcia. again. So it's part of our uh, initial response to every wildland fire in the National Forest or any fire in the nearby jurisdiction that threatens the National Forest. We uh, dispatched two investigation, uh, two fire investigators to every fire. And uh, we did that on this fire and immediately on the onset of this fire, those two investigators requested an investigation team. And that team's been working uh, since the early hours of this fire and that, and that fire still remains under, under investigation. So at such time that um, we have prepared a final investigation report, uh, we will not be able to re release the details of the investigation, but uh, they're actively working the scene. Thank you, Chief Garcia. We have quite a few questions coming in about operations. So we're gonna have uh, our operations section to, uh, Chad Cook uh, go through some of those. Uh, good evening again, I've got several questions. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to categorize these questions into some of the ones that you've asked. And um, I'll start with, I know, I, as I discuss some of the stuff, there, one, one of the main questions that's come in on multiple uh, post-its here is regarding the actual structure protection that's in place down there. So let's talk about the homes and the structure protection plan. As you, as you looked at our map and I talked about the color-coded areas that actually speak to the city designations that are in here, each one of those areas has a geographical area that has a trigger point in it. And as fire moves to the south, what we do is we set those triggers based upon geographical boundary. And if fire hits one of those geographical boundaries, it sets a trigger for us to notify our local law enforcement par partners, and it also for us to initiate evacuations. Of course, oftentimes there's already warnings that are in place because of fire imminent within the community, but that actual point of mandatory evacuations changes things a little bit when it hits one of those triggers. We currently have some of those triggers that were hit, high up in the city of Arcadia and in the Monrovia area. Right now though, the fire sits quite a ways above it. We've kept the fire boxed out from those communities, but by our, some of our operations that took place uh, just in the, on the edge of the, where the homes meet the, um, the, what I'll call the toe of the slope, or right up against the foothills. So are they imminently threatened? Yes, they are in a fire zone and they are imminently threatened. But I will tell you that our lines that have been put in place, those lines that are those lines that are in there, those lines that are in there have done a good job of stopping some of the spread of that fire. And I feel very confident that we're going to be holding that. With that, one of the questions that came out of it, well, what happens if it does move down into the homes? We have a surge capacity of resources that are in and around all of these communities of structure protection agents made up of all the local fire departments, including the County of Los Angeles and cooperator health that's come in. Those resources are strategically placed all through the Pluto communities. If we do have something that spots down into the vegetation in and around the homes, we'll immediately react to that and suppress any fires that have been in and around the homes. I understand that oftentimes when you have fire looking out your windows in the evening or up on the foothill, it makes you think that things are gonna come down. I will tell you that this is backing fire coming into the communities. In the evening, we get a normal down canyon wind and that smoke will change and it seems to push smoke down over the foothill communities out of the canyons at night as a normal down canyon wind. That normal down canyon wind and the smell of smoke and the smoke community does have a heightened awareness for people. But rest assured, we do have a lot of resources that are in there to deal with that if something were to happen. One of the other questions that I had come up was, what happens if the fire were to jump from house to house to house? Well, again, phenomenon on the fire and moving in an intermixed or an, in a, uh, an interface community that's intermixed with vegetation all around it, that is always a possibility. But again, the same structure protection resources that are in there want to keep fire small, small, we want to keep our footprint small. If we do have something happen, a lot of times that's caused by wind that would cause it to go to house to house to house and we don't have any of those projecting winds. So hopefully the resources that are down in here would have a, um, a 
surge capacity and quick response in Indy fires in the community. Another question that came up was there were several questions regarding uh, how fast the fire is moving. And when we talked about the fire behavior of the incident, most of the fire is moving very, very rapidly in the canyon areas that is out here. Anything that is backing is usually backing against the wind. It's, it has the slope working against it as well. And the fire progress to the south is often much slower during the day than it is when it burns up canyon and aligns with the drainages. Uh, as you see sometimes at night when the inversion sets in, we get some humidity recovery on the fire, the smoke sets in. It's often hard for us to see some of the burning conditions. We use a lot of technology and IR to see where the fire is at and where the different locations are. And we can watch the, uh, fire spread using some of the technology that's out there. When the smoke sits over as well though, late in the afternoon when the sun hits the slopes in the afternoon on the southwest facing slopes, we get lift. When that lifts and the smoke lifts off of it, we get our normal up canyon wind and that's when we see fire behavior usually in the afternoon really start to increase. So I hope that talks a little bit about fire spread. It really has to align with heat, slope, and the wind. And we see those active runs that are usually up in the canyons, but away from the homes. Another question that came up had to do with an update on Mount Waterman. Mount, Mount Waterman, all the way up to the top near the two quarter, continues to have fire all around it. We've had fire that is backing down off of Waterman, down towards two. We've had, a, those were a couple of spot fires. We were on the campground up on top, but everything has been picked up up there. But that is the current location on the northern spread of fire up there on Mount Waterman. Um, another question you had was uh, info on Little Santa Anita Canyon. Little Santa Anita Canyon sits strategically just off to the west of the, um, of, of course, of the big Santa Anita Canyon, which is just um, sits off here. It is not currently threatened. Our containment lines have it outside of that. But if you were to draw a diagonal, um, diagonal line up to Mount Wilson where our containment line is at, you can definitely highly visible from that area, but it is not under imminent threat in that section. Uh, there's several other questions that were asked um, regarding fire spread. I think I summed that up with, uh, with the way the fire has been moving. I hope I summed up all your questions regarding uh, structure defense and some of the stuff. And um, there's a question here, what is the probability that the evacuation warning areas will expand? That is always a potential. Whether or not it extends down into the communities, it could definitely expand off to the east or up to the north, depending on what our fire behavior conditions are. So that's always a possibility that, uh, that we could be changing our evacuation warnings into other parts of the other communities that could be affected. Uh, with that, I think that's all your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Our next question was on air quality. We're gonna have Rich, our instant meteorologist, come up and tackle that one. Uh, yes, yeah, so the question about air quality. Obviously, since the fire began, air quality in the entire, in the entire region has been very, very poor. Uh, looks like for the next several days, the you know, uh, poor air quality will, will likely continue because just not a lot of strong wind in the upper atmosphere to mix out the smoke. However, by Friday into the weekend, we're looking for a bit stronger winds along in the atmosphere. And as those winds kick in from the southwest, it should help mix things out and hope to get better, better air quality by this weekend. However, a, even at that point, it still might end up being the modern category, but at least it should be an improvement by this weekend of what we've seen in the last several days. Thank you, Rich. So our next question is about the area around Chantilly Flat. That's Chief Bobby Alex Garcia from the Angeles National Forest. And good evening. The question in regards to uh, Chantry Flats, the uh, Adams Pack Station, the camp started in the cabin in the canyon. The, uh, the uh, firefighting efforts last night under the operations section, with, uh, as Chad mentioned, the fire moved into uh, the Chantry Flats area late uh, yesterday afternoon, early evening. We did have a small contingent of structure protection resources to do some defensive firing in the Chantry Flats area and around the uh, Adams Pack Station itself. Uh, we did not have uh, the ability to have resources down in the canyon on um, a six mile stretch to Camp Sturdivant. Uh, we haven't had any updated intel this afternoon as far as how those um, historical cabins and the lower cabins fare. I imagine over the next 24 hours we'll, we'll be able to get in there. Today there's a lot of fire activity in that canyon. Thank you, Chief. We have a question about some of the evacuations in Monrovia. We have uh, Fire Chief uh, Brad Dover. Good evening, thank you. Uh, this question is, is Monrovia safe, which is a wide question, and is there uh, no need for evacuations? Um, as far as is Monrovia safe, uh, there's still active fire operations going on in a uh, area just below Trask, which is on the 
uh, east side of town and above Monrovia and uh, Bradbury. We do have containment lines uh, or uh, lines around those from dozers as well as spot check drops uh, to protect the neighborhoods to the south. However, those are all under evacuation warnings as well as the rest of um, the areas that were early posted, not only in Monrovia, but the uh, neighborhoods to the west in Arcadia and Sierra Madre. Um, so uh, we also have firefighters throughout because there was fire, active fire throughout Monrovia and the Foothill communities. So we do have firefighters monitoring those, even though there is an active flame, there are still hot spots. So the evacuation warnings will continue until the fire operations stop and at such time that we feel like we can live those safely. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, we also have uh, some questions about Sierra Madre, uh, about the evacuations. <laughs> Chief Bartlett. Good afternoon, Brett Pleasant, uh, Interim Fire Chief of Sierra Madre. If I'm understanding correctly, the evacuation that actually took place. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we evacuated uh, 32 homes in our northeast section of, uh, of Sierra Madre. Basically, we went in conjunction with our, our neighboring uh, city of Arcadia uh, due to a uh, potential threat in the Arcadia Wilderness Park area. Uh, we definitely didn't want, want our folks uh, feeling out of, feeling that they were left alone. So in the best interest of that uh, portion of our community as well, with the Arcadia residents, uh, we decided to move them out as one unit out of that area. So hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question about hotels uh, that are being used uh, for the evacuees, Miriam. The question being which ones or are they using hotels? We are so for evacuation, we're asking people to come into our evacuation point where we can assess your needs, see what needs to uh, where you need to go. And right now, we are providing lodging in hotels, um, and that's where we're also providing all of our other sources um, and resources. Thank you. We have uh, a couple more operation questions, Chad. Uh, one of them is why can't we see flame and smoke, but the fire line is getting closer? Why can't we see flame and smoke, but fire line is getting closer? Okay, kind of like what we talked about regarding the inversion setting in at night. Well, oftentimes in the evening hours, like we get a lot of that down canyon push that we talked about. And the visibility from the homeowners and from the residential structures, and even all the way down to the freeway. As you look up at the foothills, the smoke really thickens as the humidity rises and as we, as the, as the, we get cooling at night, and we get that down canyon push of the winds, and it pushes the smoke all the way down. But what usually ends up happening is the fire start is, continues to progress down, of course, because we have defensive actions that were taking place. But as that fire continues to press down, oftentimes people wait in the morning, they didn't see any fire, next thing you know, the fire's all the way down there lower. And that's just because of visibility. It's because of the visibility, the smoke that's obscuring the view. But those are some of the things I've talked about. Oftentimes it's hard to tell where the fire is, and that's one of the triggers that we use for evacuations and for warnings of people because it is often visible to tell where is the fire at in relation to. Thank you. If we could have someone from LA County uh, talk about the uh, use of the Firehawk. It's a general question. But Anthony Whittle, LA County, do they have any specifics on that? No specifics. Uh, we have used uh, uh, the Firehawks throughout the fire. Uh, they have been uh, making sure that the, as uh, Chief Cook uh, mentioned, the Southern progression coming down into the foothill communities. We were checking that, making sure that it would, the, the uh, tempo and force of that fire uh, would stay within our control lines. Um, they also have been supporting uh, some of the crews where other helicopters couldn't get in. Um, the incident does have aircraft assigned, so the incident aircraft is the priority. And again, aircraft on this incident has been significantly weather-based. Uh, visibility has been extremely difficult for all of the pilots. Uh, hopefully, uh, people online today saw that we had some uh, good southwest push of the winds. We had some lift, and today was a good aircraft day. Uh, today, our Hawks did not fly. The incident aircraft did fly, but uh, LA County Firehawks did fly. I believe it's uh, three days 
to this point and did outstanding work for the Twin Hill communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chief, uh, we have a couple more questions from some of the operations. Could we talk um, a little bit about the fire perimeter and the plan? Sure, I know we have a couple questions. Uh, to tag on to uh, Chief Woodall regarding the, uh, the aircraft use, I know we have another question regarding uh, air tankers and usage of fire retardant on the, on the planes of the fire. But we'll talk, uh, to tag into what he was talking about, air resources are contingent upon the weather. And when you see that smoke that layers in there, just like we've talked about, when you're not able to see the fire front, you have to remember that the pilots that are out there that are navigating the fire line, it's very, very difficult for you to have reference when you can't see the ground. And what ends up happening with these operations is it is very, very dangerous in steep canyons for us to be flying in those steep canyons without some type of reference. Now, when you're in there, you're also flying in the wire environment. And flying in the wire environment is extremely dangerous, especially with external loads. If you have a bucketed aircraft, even a fixed tank aircraft, it is very difficult for you to navigate in canyons and in these different environments. So we take opportunities where we can. Oftentimes, we'll have small windows of clear air in certain areas, and we're able to get in there and we're able to use aircraft in those areas. When you talk about the fixed wing aircraft, uh, the larger uh, retardant dropping aircraft, you have to think of it this way too. The aircraft needs to have an approach zone and a departure zone. It's not just come in, drop it, and leave. You you actually have to have it lined up right, and you have to have a good exit. Most of the drops you see are all down canyon over the residential areas. So what happens is they have to have clear air over that residential. Oftentimes in the morning hours, when you when you wake up in the morning and that inversion is sitting in, they don't have a clear exit path for those aircraft to leave. So we might find areas where we can use them. Sometimes we can't use them at all for the whole day. It never really clear, clears enough or lifts enough for them to have a safe approach and departure zone for those aircraft. Uh, I just want to make sure we cover that because that's very important for us to understand why air resources are not being used. So before you sit down, Chad, we have quite a few questions coming in from Altadena and Pasadena. If you could uh, talk about the evacuation possibilities or where the fire is in relationship to those communities. Okay, so Leanne and Mount Wilson are up here. Uh, we anticipate fire to be up at Mount Wilson sometime uh, tonight, I think would be safe to say. Fire is just below Mount Wilson, but if you go down to this lookout point, we have a nice uh, dozer line that has been put in down towards our what we call drop point 55, which is kind of comes down. It's kind of hard for me to show you on this map, but topographically it comes off one of the ridges and it comes right back down into Santa Anita Canyon. That is our primary fire containment line. We would like to see fire not progress any further to the west by using that line. Now, of course, we always have a contingency plan. We have a backup plan. We have a plan upon plan in the event that that doesn't fit into our, like, again, all of the factors that we're dealing with, fuel, weather, fire behavior conditions, getting firefighters in a safe position in their very steep, very rugged, uh, difficulty, difficult to access terrain. If they can't come down, we can't get in there for the firefight. We are always looking at backup plans. So you talk about the cities of Pasadena, Sierra Madre that are out here. Yes, if we end up having to go to one of our bigger plans that finds another ridge system that's further out, those communities can definitely be impacted. But right now, we're going with our primary containment line off of Mount Wilson back down to Santa Canyon, and that is what we're trying to hold it to right now. Uh, I think the next several days should show whether we'll be successful with that. And Again, with all the good work that's gone up there and us having a little bit of clear air, a little bit of better westerly wind flow across the fire today, we've been able to take advantage of some of that aircraft and hopefully to hold that footprint. But that is currently where the fire is sitting. It is sitting in San Anita Canyon. It is on the west side of San Anita Canyon, but below Mount Wilson, and it's progressed up Chantry, up through Chantry Flats and a little higher up into the station for its Thank There's you so much. Quick, yep. Just I want to give a progression, just a little bit of a reminder of uh, where we work where we're at and uh, kind of where we're going. Uh, evacuations and repopulations are evaluated usually twice a day, and we're, we're going to continue to do that. But I just want to take us back to the initial start. And uh, when the fire started making its run southerly, there was an original uh, warning produced, right, for the um, areas of the Wardy, Bradbury, Monrovia. Uh, once that the fire continued to get established and to remind everybody, we had a Santa wind, Santa Ana wind event on Tuesday and Wednesday approaching. We made the decision as a unified command team to extend that evacuation warning point 
from the Azusa Duarte point all the way around the Horn to Altadena because our technology was telling us that the wind, the northeast wind, were going to potentially push some stuff that way. We've seen the, the historical fire runs in California for the past few years, so that's why we kept that. After the Santa Ana wind event passed, the fire continued to make its progression down into the Monrovia, the Arcadia, and the Sierra Medi points. And so that's why the uh, warnings were executed in Arcadia and parts of Sierra Madre. Continuing forward, the good news from the weatherman is we, right now we do not have a, uh, a Santa Ana wind event that's uh, imminent. But uh, so I just wanted to bring everybody where we're at today and the constant reevaluation of our evacuation uh, warning and order. Thank you, Chief. We have a couple of specific questions to the Angeles, uh, one on the trail and then also about fire rehab. Uh, Chief Garcia. Yeah, the first question fits into what I shared about Camp Sturdivant and uh, Chantry Flats um, regarding the Sturdivant Falls Trail. And that, that's in that same vicinity where we had intense fire uh, late last night and early uh, today in Santa Anita Canyon. So we'll have to wait and see uh, what today's operational period brings as far as intelligence on that particular area. And those, uh, that ship change will occur as we speak with day resources coming out and that resources going in. As far as the uh, question regarding the post burn uh, uh, rehab and the, and the reference mudslide. So as part of our fire response, we have what we call a BEAR team, a B-A-E-R, Burn Area uh, Emergency Response Team. And that team will be mobilized um, early in the incident to start assessing uh, the burn severity on the slopes and what types of treatments can be done to prevent uh, further uh, damage as a result of the burn scar. Just like the uh, operation on the wildland uh, fire suppression aspect of Unified Command, the post burn response team will, will coordinate with each uh, jurisdictional agency uh, to provide that analysis. That team comes with geologists, hydrologists, and a number of other specialists to help pinpoint not only where the damage could occur, but what the severity will be. And that team will work with each local jurisdiction to provide that, that information so each jurisdiction can work on their pre-winter, pre-storm activity. Before you leave, uh, we had one more question on the status of Vetter Mountain Fire Lookout. Yeah, Vetter Mountain uh, Fire Lookout for uh, many uh, of those that uh, are familiar with that site. Uh, that site was uh, severely damaged and, and really fully destroyed in 2009 during the station fire. Uh, we have been fortunate enough that within the last year, within the last six months, to have a complete reconstruction of that site. That, that site sits off to the west of where the current fire perimeter is now. Um, that fire, that uh, fire lookout is well within the station fire burn star, the burned area from 10 years ago, and there's no eminent threat to uh, the, the better lookout. Thank you, Chief. We're going to have Rich come back up. We have a question on why is smoke worse in the morning and better in the evening? <laughs> Yes, a uh, question about smoke and why it's when it is a, a usually much worse in the morning. Uh, as Chief Cook alluded to, one of the big things in this fire, and then we're up along down the, the southern California coast, we deal with what's called an inversion. An inversion is simply, you can imagine it's just like a lid in the atmosphere. So what happens is during the late evening and overnight hours, you have a lot of cooling near the surface. And as that, if that certain cools, cooling near the surface, it sets up this inversion. And this inversion can act like a lid will trap all that smoke and all that ash and all that haze from the fire. And so by the time the morning rolls around, the sunrise, you start to have sunrise, and that inversion is really, really strong, trapping all that smoke and all that ash within right near the surface, and that produces the reduced visibility, which Chief Cook said, you know, greatly impacts the aviation operations. It also gives that really poor air quality, very poor visibility. So what happens as the sun comes up and you get the heating during the day, that inversion gradually lifts. And so as the inversion lifts, the air becomes a bit clearer than by the afternoon. Uh, usually that inversion usually breaks and the, and the air quality definitely improves. The smoke dissipates and you have much, much, more, much better visibility across the area. And then evening rolls around, that inversion starts developing again and you have that same process. You have that inversion sets up during the nighttime morning hours, gives you the poor visibility, lots of smoke. And then as the day wears on, that inversion lifts and breaks and gives you much better air quality and much better visibility. Thank you, Rich. We have a question about pets um, and their possible um, exposure to smoke. Miriam? So we're working with different community partners to help with um, pet safety. So 
So all pets are welcome at our evacuation point. And then from there, we will, um, we're, I mean, smoke safety is going to be the same for anybody. Um, and we're working with our community partners of where to put them and how to keep them safe. Um, one of the things that we're taking precaution is COVID safety. So that's why in our hotels, you may not find a pet there, but we'll be working with them to make sense. Thank you so much. We have a couple more operations questions. Uh, Chad Cook. I fielded a few more questions that come in. Uh, one of the first questions is the prognosis for Highway 2. And uh, I feel confident with the Highway 2 border. Earlier we mentioned the fuel modification or a change in fuel modification. So I want to definitely make sure that you understand that the fuel that's up on top up around the Highway 2 corridor is completely different than the fuel model that's down here. And we feel successful that we should be able to hold on to that up on that on the top of uh, Highway 2. It mentions specifically the communities of Little Rock, uh, Juniper Hills, Para Blossom out there. As you come off the, the ridge system way up high, up near Mountain High up there, and all the way down to the desert floor, that area up there, that's a completely different change in fuel modification, and I would not feel that those communities would be threatened coming into the into more of a desert fuel model. One of the things that took it since it took several days for it to reach Monrovia Peak. What if it were to jump from Mount Wilson to Mount Harvard and or Harvard and move out towards Eaton Canyon? That is quite a distance into the Pasadena area, Eaton Canyon. Is it possible? Absolutely. Given the right weather phenomenon, given the right wind conditions, if something were to set up in that period of time, could fire move that way? Absolutely. We have a lot of uncontrolled fire line that sits off to the west. Probability-wise, with what we see weather-wise in our containment, in our box for the fire, and our contingency lines, I would say it would be a low probability, but anything is possible with a certain weather phenomenon. And the last thing that question that came up was regarding air tanker usage and where are all the VLATs. First of all, what people keep hearing on the news regarding VLATs, VLAT stands for very large air tanker. It's capacity of uh, fire retardant. In California, there's, um, there's only so many air attack bases that are in California. All those tankers are strategically placed at different uh, bases. As new fires erupt, or there is a life safety or imminent structure defense situation, Priorities are set for those air tankers to go to those fires. As we have greatly reduced the threat to some of the structures, although we still have evacuations, what we do is we look at, does it align with the air quality that we talked about? Is it safe for the pilots to drop? And at the time that we do get that clear air, when an order is placed for a large air tanker, does it fulfill the mission based upon what base it's at? Can it reload at that base? Is it being used on one of the several fires in California? So you just have to understand the priorities about how we do that. It is a constant shifting of air tankers and resources. Today, though, we did receive three VLAT drops on the fire uh, up near the Mount Wilson area. Uh, and I believe there was some more happening tonight as we were coming into this meeting. So I would say that we got uh, a good volley of uh, fire retardant on the western side of this fire tonight. So I just want you to make sure you understood about how air tankers are moved. And again, even with air tankers responding into fires, you have to remember that a new start takes priority. And we want to try to keep fires small. I have a couple more questions, Chad. Could you talk about the criteria used to determine containment? Yes, so containment's an interesting one. A lot of people always ask us, why is the numbers not higher or what's going on? Again, there's a lot of fires in California, so I want to preface this real quick. With all the fires in California and a lot of things going on, we are at somewhat of a resource drawdown. That resource drawdown on the fire means that we have not validated all the fire lines around us. We have some places that we have not had firefighters in certain areas. Although the fire hasn't progressed, we just don't want to simply put black line on the map when we still have heat in the perimeter. That would be a false sense of security, and we don't want to send that out to the public that there is containment on this fire when there really isn't. As you can tell, we're still using the stabilization strategy. Stabilization strategy means with a minimal number of resources, we move strategically around the incident to bring resolve to certain areas and we slowly come around the fire. We have to do that because we're low on resources, because we're competing with all the other fires in the state. So with that, as we move around the fire, you'll see more black line and more containment numbers come up. But again, we don't want to give you a false sense of security by putting black on the map that still has heat in it. Thank you, Chad. Uh, Chief Dover, is uh, Camp Trask okay? Camp Trask actually had uh, two or three nights ago fires in on it. It was a backing fire, and the decision was made to actually fire around that. And uh, I have pictures. It was there last night, and uh, it was in good shape. Every all the buildings, um, the fort, uh, all of the out uh, buildings, the cabins were in good shape and still standing. No damage. 
Thank you. We have another question about uh, health. It's uh, should more the more vulnerable with low immunity wear masks at home too? We have our incident meteorologist that will. I guess with regard to air quality and people who have low immunity or lower immunity, I would say yes. You know, the best course of action would be to wear a mask. You know, until that time when you start seeing reports from the air quality folks that the air quality is improving, the fire is under control, and there's you know much better uh, air out there to breathe. And until that point, I'd say those more at risk people should continue wearing masks. Thank you. All right, we got uh, a couple more operation questions, and if somebody else wants to field them, feel free. Uh, the next one is, uh, are there backup plans in place if a fire jumps contingency line? Yes, we're always planning. This is a, an interesting part of the fire service. We always have a plan, and I will tell you that oftentimes our plans are challenging, and they may not align with everybody's holidays or weather or you know, different problems. What ends up happening is we have a lot of plans that are out there. We're always reevaluating for to have something we anticipate things happening. With that anticipation, you know, we try to make a good plan. We try to use ridges that are solid. People ask us why you, we use ridge systems. Topographically, they're safer for us to work from. Topographically, they yield to the best firefighting. Uh, oftentimes, getting up out of the smoke, we have better visibility and we can see things from ridges. Um, there's a few other things that go into that, but we like to use our ridge systems. As you know, this entire front country is very, very difficult, steep knife or razorback ridge systems. All of this front country that has those ridge systems, it's very difficult for us to have multiple contingency lines. But yes, we have several identified, not only to the west, also out to the east, and some also out towards the end, the northwest as well. Again, you have to remember, we have a large, uh, we, use, we take advantage of a lot of fire footprints, uh, past fire history in the area. And we have a, a large fire that burned out here about 12 years ago called the Station Fire, uh, with a definite fuel modification. We also have some recent fire history out to the east just this year. As a matter of fact. Thank you. We have a couple more questions coming in about evacuations. Uh, are we going to evacuate below Altadena Drive? Altadena Drive. I have, uh, are we going to evacuate below Altadena Drive? Do we have any additional? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Have any structures been lost? Uh, and they're uh, referring to Sturdivant Camp. Sturdivant Camp. Have any structures been lost at Sturdivant Camp, et cetera? Yeah, so Sturdivant Camp's uh, a little, uh, around three miles below Mount Wilson on foot and about six miles from Chantry on foot. So we haven't had anybody in there yet to gather that intelligence. Uh, the fire was very active in there last night and again today in the North Fork of Santa Anita Canyon, so we don't, we don't have that information yet. Thank you. Is the fire likely to cross the 210 freeway? I would say that is highly unlikely that it would cross the 210 freeway. There just is not the fuel bed to support that, and you would have to have um, an incredible weather phenomenon to cover all that kind of ground. We have one more for you, Chad. Uh, are there plans to contain the western end? Uh, the, what is the plan to contain the western end of the fire? Okay, the entire western side. The plan is to come off of Mount Wilson, where we have our resources up there now, and to take our containment line down from Mount Wilson back into Santa Anita Canyon and completely button up any further south or westerly spread in that corridor. On the top, we are going to use open up old uh, lines from the station fire, which have already been started. And we're going to uh, corral the fire into that fuel modification of the station fire and take it all the way back up to Highway 2 and button up the whole western side. Thank you. We have another question on smoke. Uh, Rich, what is the best way to mitigate the smoke and smell inside your home? All right, the best way to mitigate the smoke and the smell of smoke in your home, uh, I would say, uh, first off, when you can, try and keep windows and doors closed, you know, to kind of limit the amount of air coming into your home. And then also, if you can, have some sort of air filter, you know, the, you know, have air filter running inside your home that'll help clear up any uh, pollutants in the air and to give you better air quality within the home. But generally, I would say definitely try and keep your windows closed, your doors closed, and just kind of limit the amount of outside air coming in and just use filters if you can. Thank you. Is Canyon Park still burning? Go ahead. 
Canyon Park two nights ago did have fire come down and um, all the way up to a uh, line that was cut that uh, went across and that was south of the uh, lower kiosk and that has been contained or extinguished at this time. So there's no active fire in Canyon Park. Thank you. <laughs> We have a couple questions about this recording. Just to let you know that this recording is being, this, this presentation is being recorded. We will close caption it. It will be available tomorrow on NCWEB. That is I-N-C-I-W-E-B dot N-W-C-G dot gov. Also on the Forest Facebook page, we'll make sure that there are links and we'll also provide it on our cooperators um, social media platforms as well. Again, um, we will provide those links. It will be available to you. We will close caption it per the uh, cap. We were unable to have our sign language interpreter, so it will be closed caption for tomorrow morning. We had some questions about the progress. People wanted to check, uh, track the fire progress. Why only two updates a day? The main reason um, we do try to provide additional uh, updates throughout the day using our social media platforms through all of our partners and Unified Command um, as well as all of our public information for uh, all of our other cooperators. With that, we try to give you an uh, afternoon update, but getting the intelligence from the people on the ground does take actual time. And our mapping missions are only done uh, certain times uh, during the day with uh, specific types of aircraft. The other time they are engaged in water droppings and actually fighting the fire. So we do, uh, our best to get you those as timely as possible. I do also want to let you know that we do have a story map. That link is found right off of NCWeb, where you actually can see the MODIS, which is the heat footprint, which is a satellite um, picture that is available to you so you can watch that part of the progression. I will let you know though that that is a satellite. It is not 100% accurate to the ground. It will give you an indication though of where we have a large amount of heat on the fire. We have another question here on Google Maps shown, showing fire in one area and then Rovia's updates um, in different on different platforms. They counter, uh, counter, uh, counterdict each other. Um, I think that depending on when those people pull those updates, you're going to have different representation of when those fires are, where those fires are located. Again, they are flown at different times and they are pulled through an infrared camera and ground truth with our resources on the ground. We have uh, observers out in the field and we collect that information and it is updated as quickly as we can get it on there. Now, some of these platforms have different lag times and so dependent on when they actually pull that information, you're gonna see that that is gonna show a different footprint throughout the day. We have a couple more questions on evacuation being listed. Does somebody want to talk about um, the, again, about how we are going to assess those on a? Sure, again, well, reevaluate repopulation and evacuation uh, downgrades twice a day, working with all partners. Number one priority is the safety, obviously, of the community and making sure that no infrastructure is damaged, uh, uh, Edison lines, uh, roads, uh, issues like that. So again, twice a day, we run it through the entire system of the uh, incident management teams, and uh, we will continue to do that. A lot of it is based on uh, prediction of fire spread, fire behavior, uh, technology for our uh, um, spread models, but uh, be assured that we are evaluating that. The, the worst thing that, uh, happens sometimes is we repopulate or we remove orders and then the uh, weather um, provides some tricks to us uh, that, that delivers fire in areas. So we'd like to keep, and, and again, the community's been outstanding. We've had uh, our folks in the communities, the, the communities that have the evacuation warnings, they've been extremely cooperative. Uh, the ones that have the orders, uh, we understand the inconvenience, but again, for your safety, and we're going to we, we, we evaluate it today. Uh, the partners are going to reevaluate again tomorrow, and we will be getting that information through the channel so you're aware. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, could each of the uh, fire chiefs talk about their uh, warning systems? I think Nexel is the one that is used here. How do people sign up for it? Um, how would they get information on uh, those and any other additional apps that you might have for people to get fire alerts in your local areas? Monrovia does use Nexel as an opt-in system, so you can go on the city's website and sign up there. You can also text um, the number to Nexel. I don't have that off the top of my head. That is on our city website. And we also push out information um, in all of the, the typical ways of tweets, uh, Instagram, or the other uh, social media platforms uh, in the city of Monrovia. And then for this incident, we used a, a collaborative uh, messaging system. Thank you. There also from, uh, there is an, an application online called Wildfires Near Me. If you Google that one, you can actually put your actual address in that system and sign up to have alerts when fires uh, are within a certain amount of distance from the address that you located. Are there any other systems that you guys utilize? Yes, naming my late parts of City of Arcadia. City of Arcadia, we use Nixle as well as um, Alert Arcadia. Go to arcadia.ca.gov forward slash alerts. And you can also, we specifically go through the webpage for this fire, so you can arcadiastate.gov uh, forward slash uh, wildcat, you can get the information that way. Plus all of the Twitter, uh, Instagram, as well as Facebook. And we also have a new opt-in for our community called Community Connect. We were first used to give you updated information as well. Thank you. We have a, a couple more that just came in. Could someone talk about the threat to the community west of La Quetadita? Oh. We just have one more notification system for all unincorporated communities in Greater Los Angeles County's Alert LA County through the Office of Emergency Management. In addition to that, LA County Fire Department provides services for 59 of the 88 cities within the county of Los Angeles. So with that, many of the communities either operate Nixle or other forms of communicating to their uh, uh, community members. So it's important to have awareness of uh, alert LA County and of course what your uh, city is utilizing to notify its citizens. Uh, if, I, if I could add as well for the uh, CPS here in Madre, uh, all the, uh, the fire notifications, uh, we are also implementing those as far as the next level. Uh, we are also signed up basically through the incident command for uh, for a WIA, which is also basically similar to the, an AMBER alert. Uh, to tie in with that, uh, we will also get down to the personal level. We will have law enforcement doing door knocks, going through the, uh, the communities and, and notifying our, our residents in just the same, so thank you. I appreciate that. I do want to reiterate that we realized that many people were not able to get on today uh, due to a cap on the Zoom system. We apologize for that. Again, this will be recorded. We will actually close caption it and we will make it available as soon as possible. We'll have it up by tomorrow morning. We do apologize for the amount that we're unable to get in today, uh, but we will try to make this available as quickly as possible. We had a question on the threat to the community west of La Quetadita. La Quinata. At this time, low probability. At this time, low probability, but it's still on the radar. Thank you. We had a couple more operational questions. Chief Garcia? Uh, the first one was a uh, question asked about Crystal Lake, the status of the uh, cafe. So we, I spent some time there myself yesterday, and all the structures are in and around Crystal Lake, including the cafe, uh, are, are in good shape. There's still some fire activity in the area there, but there is some containment in that, uh, in, in that area as well. The other question is in regards to the community of Juniper Hills and Valiermo. I'm sure you've seen uh, smoke that lays down the evening down into the valley down off Pleasant View Ridge in the wilderness there, but there are no uh, threats currently to either Juniper Hills or the community of Valiermo. Thank you. We have a question about is there anything that the public can do to help firefighters? We could uh, maybe a couple of people take that one. Yeah, one of the things that you can do is just support them. Uh, they're, they're, they're well fed. The firefighters are well fed and well taken care of, and, and, and that's really our responsibility as unified commanders. Um, basically, it's uh, one of the things that they like seeing when they come into the fire, fire area is uh, the sign that says thank you. 
and everybody appreciates it. Thank you, and I'm, I know that those firefighters do the same. Any other keys? I think I mean I think we'll all agree the number one thing you can do is, is to follow if you hear an alert and order is to follow those immediately and get out of our way or out of the fire department's way so they can make entry to better serve you and make sure what the community is ready. Any questions? All right, I think that, that is gonna close us up for the evening. I want to reiterate again that we do apologize for the cap that we had this evening. This will be recorded. All of the unanswered questions will be answered and we will get them back to you with the actual recording that will be closed captioning. I want to thank all of the presenters tonight for all of your time. We really appreciate it. And with that, uh, everyone have a safe evening and we will get back to you on when our next meeting is. Uh, we'll be looking into how we can increase the cap so we can get more people on this next one and we'll get that out to you as soon as we get that posted. Thank you so much and have a great evening.